Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Craig and I'm a software developer in the UK. And in this video, we're going to add to our library of HTML elements that we know well and use often. But the main focus of this video is on how different elements display by default and the difference between what we would call block level elements and inline elements. We'll take time to pick these apart and understand their nuances and we'll define what each of these are and what the difference is between them. Browsers would typically display block level elements on a new line and you can visualize them as a stack of boxes. Conversely, inline elements only occupy the space that their content needs and they do not need to start on a new line like block level elements. Before we start, if you like the content on the channel, then please remember to smash the like button, subscribe and comment as it really helps with YouTube's algorithm. Okay, so that being said, let's get started. So let's start by heading on over to the MDN element reference to see what other HTML elements are available to us. The link is in the description below for you guys. So MDN is basically an almanac for web developers to reference and it contains all of the info that you need on any given topic related to web development. It is maintained by Mozilla, who you may know as the developers of the Firefox browser. And it really is the go-to resource if you need to reference something quickly. If you forget the syntax for JavaScript arrow functions or you need to brush up on your array methods, then head over here and you'll find exactly what you need. So you can see that there are hundreds of elements here. This page has all of the elements used in HTML and honestly, there's a handful here that you will use regularly. You certainly don't need to know everything, so don't feel like you do. Some you'll never use and some are actually deprecated and will be phased out eventually and no longer work. We'll cover all of the elements that we need in the upcoming videos. Some that you'll use all the time like H1 through H3 and the P or paragraph element, which we've seen and used previously in previous videos and the A or anchor tag, div, image, UL, LI, etc. And we'll cover what all of these mean, of course, in depth. So we looked at H1 through H6 and P or paragraph elements in the last video and I have those here in VS Code. We should notice that all of these elements are what we would call block level elements. Well, what are block level elements? Well, a block level element is one that always starts on a new line in the browser and pushes everything else on the page down to a new line. If we right click one of the elements and select inspect, we can open up Google Chrome's DevTools. DevTools gives us lots of information and tools to work with and we can see what is actually going on under the hood of any given web page. We can see the HTML that is responsible for the structure of the page. We can see the styles applied plus lots of other things that we addressed in the DevTools video that I did previously on the channel. DevTools is something that you will use constantly while developing your web pages. It's a really indispensable tool that is difficult to imagine being without these days. We're not going to cover all of the intricacies of DevTools right now as I have covered that in a separate video. But just know that you can inspect any HTML elements on the page in this way. My DevTools is anchored to the right of the page as that's where I like it personally. You may prefer to have it in a totally different place and you can choose to dock it elsewhere by clicking on these three ellipsis dots and selecting where you want to dock the panels. You can dock them to the bottom, to the left, or even pop them out into a new window if you so wish. I prefer the right hand side as I said. If you have yours open, you may notice that yours has a white background rather than black, and that's because I have the dark theme enabled. You can access that if you wish by clicking the three ellipsis dots again, going down to settings and under appearance, checking the option for the dark theme. I find it a little easier on the eyes than the lighter theme personally, particularly when you're working late at night, which I often find myself doing. You'll notice that in the top panel, which is the elements pane, I have an overview of my HTML structure. Here I can hover my cursor over any element and it will be highlighted inside the browser window. I can also click on this arrow in the top left corner and hover elements on the page and see exactly where they are within the HTML. The reason that I show this to you now is because I want you to notice that each element is stretching the full length of the viewport and takes up the whole line that it sits on, pushing the next element underneath. So this is what block level elements do. They will exhibit this behavior. We can of course override this with the CSS display property, but we will get to this a little later on in the CSS section of videos. 
The opposite to block level elements are inline elements, which do not start on a new line and will sit next to each other, only taking up the space that the element's content needs. Inline elements include images, links, and HTML text formatting, such as making bold text and italic text. So let's have a look at a couple of these now. If we go to the MDN HTML elements reference once again, we'll open this A element in a new tab and scrolling down the image or IMG element also. So starting with the A element, we see that the A or anchor element creates a hyperlink to other web pages, files, locations within the same page, email addresses, or any other URL. So in short, this is the element that we use to create links, either to external locations, to internal locations within the page that we're on, say for example, a navbar link going to a particular section of the page, or even to other pages that our site has, say a contacts form for example. We see it contains this href or hyperlink reference attribute, and that is where the link will go to. If we're linking to an external site, we need the full URL, including the HTTP protocol here. So please keep that in mind. The IMG element embeds an image into the document. So this is the HTML element that can be used to include images in our pages. We can also include images with CSS and with JavaScript, but for now, this is the element that we want. It comes with this SRC attribute, which is the image URL. So where the browser needs to fetch the image from if it's going to display it on our page. That could be from a local source within our own project's file structure or even from an external location out on the web. So let's go to our text editor and we'll add some of these elements in. So using the magic of Emmet, I'll type A and hit tab and here we have our A or anchor element built for us. We need to fill in the href and also give it some text or other content so that there is something that is clickable on the page. So I'll add the href of http colon double forward slash www.google.com and I'll add the text content of link to Google. I'll duplicate this twice more and change the relevant details inside so that the second link is going to go to Microsoft. So I'll just change the href location and the text content and I will repeat this again to make a third link and this one is going to point to apple.com and I'll remember to change the text content as well. Lastly, I'll add an image element by typing IMG and using the power of Emmet to do the rest. We need to fill in the SRC or source attribute, which will put an image on the page for us. We might have these images, as I say, stored in a folder within the same file structure as our project, but as we don't have these at the moment, we'll go to unsplash.com and link to an image from there. So just on the home page, we'll scroll down and find any image. So this one will do. And if I right click, I can select copy image address. Returning to VS Code, I can now paste that into the SRC or source. I don't want this image to appear too large on the page, so I'm also going to add an extra attribute, and that is the height attribute, and I'll give that the value of 200 pixels. Okay, so if I save now, we see these are displayed in the browser, and you'll notice that these are not all starting on new lines, but are in fact sitting next to each other. Before we carry on, let's just quickly test the links to check that they are working. So the first goes to Google, no problem. Second is going to Microsoft as intended. And lastly, we go to Apple's website. So it's all working just fine and just as expected. If we inspect these elements, we see that they are very different to the other elements that we've previously made. They sit next to each other on the same line, they do not stretch the full width of the page, and they are only as big as their content needs to be, which is pretty interesting. And that's because these are inline elements which behave very differently to block level elements. We'll learn when we get to the CSS how we can override these behaviors with the display property and even have elements which are inline blocks and these combine some of the behaviors from both block level and inline elements. But for now, just remember that elements can be block or they can be inline. 
A block level element will always start on a new line and take up the full width available, so it stretches out to the left and right as far as it can. An inline element does not start on a new line and only takes up as much space as is necessary and is determined by its content. You can do some more reading about block and inline elements at the links below in the description that I've provided for you. If we head over to the W3 Schools page, we see that there are inline elements like strong, sup, sub, and m. So we'll finish up by looking at these inline elements, which are all responsible for formatting text. So I'll add four paragraphs using the Emmet shortcut of p multiplied by four. And in the first p element, I will give it some bold text. And this is what the strong element does text that is inside of the strong tags is going to be bold. So I'll put these tags inside of the P element by typing strong and hitting tab. I'll add my text content using 10 words of lorem ipsum and save. And here we have some bold text. In the P element below, I'll add some EM or M tags and another 10 words of lorem ipsum. And when we save, we see that we have some emphasized or some italic text. The strong tag is a semantic HTML element, which we will discuss in a future video. In HTML5, it became the case that our elements needed to have a little more meaning, to be a little bit more descriptive about the jobs that they were doing. Previously, we could have added a B tag for bold, but B, when we're looking at it as developers in the code, it doesn't really tell us anything about what the element is doing to the text, to the content. Strong gives us a little more meaning and tells us that the text is going to appear strongly on the page. The same for M for italic, which gives our text some emphasis. The next two elements I'm going to do together. In the first P element, I will add SUP or SUP and hit tab. And this is for superscript text, or this is slightly smaller text that is elevated from its baseline. In the P element below, I will add SUB or sub for subscript text. And now I will select inside both elements using the command or control key and clicking. And then I'm going to type lorem 10 and I will hit tab for some more placeholder text. To see the full effect of these elements, I'll add some more text in front of the sub and sub elements. Just something like this is some text. Now, if I save, you can quite clearly see the superscript and the subscript formatting. So we see again, the use of these elements hasn't pushed anything down to the next line, given that they are inline elements. That being said, we wouldn't format our text in this way usually. Though these elements do exist and are perfectly valid HTML, it is much better practice to separate our concerns. So we will use HTML for structuring content and any styling or formatting we will do with CSS. And we have a whole host of CSS properties that make our text bold or italic or put it upside down or however we want it displayed. These elements are good to know, however, and good for us to see the differences in how block and inline elements work. You will see these in your work as developers included within older HTML uh, files. So it's good that you recognize these and understand why they're there and what they are doing. Okay, so we'll leave this video here. We saw the difference between block level and inline elements. We saw that browsers would typically display block level elements on a new line and that you can visualize those as a stack of boxes. They stretch the full width of the page, entirely blocking out the line that they are on, and they push content that follows below. Conversely, inline elements do not start on a new line. They only occupy the amount of space that their content requires. So I hope you found this distinction useful. Understanding this is essential to helping you space out your elements when you lay out your web pages, when you begin styling them with CSS. In the next video, we'll carry on building our repertoire of commonly used HTML elements, starting with lists in HTML, which are used everywhere on the web. I most commonly use lists for grouping a collection of items, like the pages internal navigation links used in a navbar, for example. So thanks for watching. I really do appreciate your time, and I hope the content is of some use to you guys. Please remember to smash the like button, subscribe, and leave a comment. All this engagement helps with YouTube's algorithm and helps others discover the channel. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.